welcome to this year's of the Climate Lecture. <coughs> and I'm very happy to see that there are so extremely many people that come here today. Uh, before I start, I just want to mention that uh, we in the Oscar Climate Committee are, of course, extremely pleased to have Professor Peter Hicks from the University of Edinburgh here. And the Oscar Climate Committee consists of me, Lars Bergström, Ulf Danielsson, and it did until uh, early August consist also of Hector Ruberstein that unfortunately passed away early August. And uh, we should really be thankful for Hector because I think it's in large part due to his connections that he managed to convince people to come here. So this uh, uh, lecture series is uh, started uh, in the memory of Oscar Klein. And Oscar Klein was born in 1894. And he was a professor in theoretical physics at Stockholm Högskola, 1930 to 1962. And Stockholm Högskola later became Stockholm University. And Oscar Klein did many different things. For example, he's known for the klein boron equation that uh, deals with how spinless particles, bosons, uh, interact. And uh, this is one of the things that Peter has been working on. He also worked with the it's famous for the Klein-Nishina equation that deals with the light scattering of electrons. And he was also ahead of his time and looked about on extra dimensions, thinking that the universe might have some extra hidden dimensions. It's hard for us to see. So Peter <coughs> was born in uh, uh, Watson, Newcastle upon Tyne, and he studied, for example, at King's College in London, where he did his undergraduate studies and PhD studies. He has also had various other posts, and in 1960 he became faculty at Edinburgh University. And probably Peter is best known for his work on broken symmetries in electrical theory, and in particular for a field that most likely is the origin for the mass of all the elementary particles. And this field, many of you have probably heard its name, is called the Higgs field. Peter. And uh, this Higgs mechanism that is thought to be the way that particles acquire mass also predicts that there should be a boson, a Higgs boson, that is probably the most sought after particle in the universe today. It's been sought after by the Americans at the Tevatron, and in about one month's time it will be uh, sought after at the Large Hadron Collider that starts uh, operating at CERN. So be, this will be a very active team in the, in the near future. Uh, Peter Hicks has also received many honors for his work. For example, he got the Dirac Medal in 1997. He got the Prize for Outstanding Contributions to Theoretical Physics from the Institute of Physics, and the 1997 High Energy and Particle Physics Prize by the European Physical Society. And in 2004, he got the Wolf Prize. Uh, today, I also got to know that he will share the 2010 Sakurai Prize. And evidently, Peter has contributed to theoretical physics like very few. And I don't think he needs to be ashamed of the others that have made contributions to theoretical physics. This is the list of previous speakers in the Oscar Klein Memorial Lecture uh, series. And with these words, I am really very pleased to have Peter Hitt here to deliver this year's Oscar Klein Lecture. And let's give Peter a that maybe we take questions after the lecture. And so, so please uh, refrain from interrupting and we take the questions after. Well, I'd like to say first that it's a great honor to be invited to give a lecture in memory of Oscar Klein, who was one of the great pioneers of my subject. Um, the title of my lecture, which I've, I've given a few times before, uh, um, well, it, it, in a way the lecture is coming home to Stockholm because the, the title of my life as a boson was inspired by the title of a Swedish film of some years ago, My Life as a Dog. <laughs>
to do the work which resulted in the boson being associated with me and uh, only towards the end will I start what was truly my life as a boson after the name was attached. So uh, to begin with I'm, I'm going to briefly uh, say some things about the ideas of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Now you probably four years ago uh, in the lecture by Yoikiro Nambu, uh, heard something about this subject already. I've just listed a number of these sort of stages in the development of the, these ideas in physics, which show how they or originated in, um, in condensed matter physics and were transferred into particle physics primarily by Nambu, who, who was rightly uh, honoured last year for, 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 for his work by a share of the noble. So the prototype of the kind of thing that is now used in particle physics was the Bardeen-Cooper theory, Bardeen theory of superconductivity. And Nambu and Jeffrey Goldstone brought these ideas into particle physics and then I shall talk about the work in which uh, Brout and Angler in Brussels and myself were involved in 1964 and how this led to the electroweak theory uh, uh, formulated first in a simpler form by Glashow in 1961 and turned into a, a viable theory by Weinberg and Salam six years later and then uh, proved to be uh, a, a really uh, viable theory in the sense of being, being possible to calculate to all orders in perturbation theory by Feldman and Tuft in 1971. So that will be the first stage and then uh, my life as a, as a boson really begins in 1972 when the, the Amsterdam conference following on Tuft's work uh, contained a, a presentation uh, by uh, Ben Lee uh, as a rapporteur in which he attached my name to pretty well everything in particle physics involving spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, <laughs> neglecting to uh, give the credit which was due to all, all the other people on that list. Um, so coming to the story of my involvement, it begins in October 1960 when I was appointed to a lectureship at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, but really it begins a little before because uh, when I was appointed, I was told uh, that, that, I, that I, I had, to, had to, to join the committee of the first Scottish University Summer School in Physics, uh, which was happening in July, and, and my job, which had some relevance to this story, was the job of steward. Uh, now, the, the job of steward was essentially to, to buy some wine and uh, look after it and distribute it to the participants at dinner, uh, and that I did with rather limited success, as you will hear. Uh, the students at that school included uh, three from Sweden, um, a Mr. Arden from, from Lund, uh, a Mr. Enflo from Stockholm, and a, a Dr. Bertel Laurent from St Stockholm. Uh, they also included four who I will refer to perhaps as the Gang of Four, uh, whose names uh, will be familiar to some of you. Um, Nicola Cabibo from Rome, uh, Shelley Glashow, who was based on CERN but who had spent a year in Copenhagen, uh, Derek Robinson from Oxford, and Tini Veltman from Utrecht. And these were 
students with a gang of four who stayed up half the night discussing theoretical physics of weak interactions, weak and electromagnetic interactions, and always missed the first lecture in the morning uh, because they couldn't get up in time. The core title of the school was Dispersion Relations, which was the popular technique of the time. So, let me briefly survey spontaneous symmetry breaking. In condensed matter physics, first of all, to, to uh, say what, what is spontaneous symmetry breaking, it's when a dynamical system has a, a, an underlying symmetry at the deep level of, it, of the interactions of the systems, um, which doesn't manifest itself fully in the, uh, in, in the physical properties of the system. Uh, in other words, it begins, well, it begins with, really with the theory of ferromagnetism, um, well, at first Weiss and then Heisenberg in 1928, and the symmetry was a continuous symmetry of rotations, uh, but despite that continuous symmetry, which is obeyed by the uh, interactions, the uh, ground state of the system has a spontaneous magnetization in a selected direction in the space. The selected direction might be anything, it depends on the history of the sample, uh, but the uh, ferromagnet does not display the full rotational symmetry that the basic interactions have. Coming closer to the kind of symmetry that is involved in particle physics, there's next the theory of superfluidity. By uh, Bogolyubov wrote a paper in 1947 in which he showed how uh, you could form a, a Bose condensate of spinless uh, particles, which would be their, say, helium atoms, and that the most condensate would spontaneously break a global Lie group U1 symmetry, which is the symmetry associated with multiplying the particle wave functions by a phase factor, e to the i psi changed to e to the i alpha psi. That's a more subtle, less geometric type of symmetry. I should say that the symmetries which condensed matter physicists uh, discuss when spontaneously breaking them are, are symmetries which you wouldn't really dream of breaking any other way than spontaneously because we believe that they're very basic to physics, rotations for example, and, uh, and then uh, to the, come to the next example, in superconductivity such a symmetry is the one associated with uh, the, well, the breaking of it is due to a charged Bose condensate, that is in the uh, theory of metallic and alloy superconductors, and the symmetry is now again of this type where a, a particle wave function is multiplied by a phase factor and the dynamics is invariant, uh, but these are now charged particles and this is the symmetry which is associated with uh, the conservation of electric charge by Noether's theorem and the first uh, theory of this type was due to I've uh, written Landau and Ginsburg in 1950 when I gave this lecture some years ago I was reprimanded by Lev Okun who said it's Ginsburg and Landau Ginsburg's name was first and Ginsburg would be unhappy if he heard him call it the Landau and Ginsburg theory um, so that uh, theory showed that a, a charged Bose condensate spontaneously breaking the symmetry associated with the electric charge conservation would act as a superconductor. Uh, but they needed charged spinless particles. Uh, but who, who knew of any charged spinless particles in a metal? And it wasn't until uh, several years later that Bardeen, Cooper and Schrieffer uh, developed uh, uh, an idea of Cooper's that it, it, the spinless particles were formed by pairing of electrons, uh, so they were composite bosons. Now, in particle theories, um, 
Bill Heisenberg started in about 1958 uh, trying theories in which a global symmetry, uh, that is, in which, say, a phase factor like this doesn't depend on coordinates, is spontaneously broken. His theories didn't really uh, attract much belief, but the real breakthrough uh, was the work of Namu in 1960. Uh, Namu had learned about superconductivity theory from Schrieffer, when Schrieffer was in Chicago briefly, and Namu saw how this could be applied in particle physics, this idea. Now, let me sketch uh, the sort of thing which Namru did. He wrote, well, he wrote a short paper in 1960, but then with uh, John Alessino, he wrote a paper describing a dynamical model of elementary particles based on an analogy with, with superconductivity. <clears throat> uh, now, the, the interesting outcome of this model uh, was the generation of mass, or apparently massless fermions. And I, I have to say that contrary to all that you read in, in a lot of places, and contrary to the, um, our chairman's introduction, the generation of, of mass by spontaneous symmetry breaking for, for uh, normal matter was not done by me. It, it was done by, already done by Nambu, uh, because he showed how, for example, an electron might gain mass by spontaneous breaking of a symmetry. The symmetry was what is called the chiral symmetry, which is one which is associated normally with massless fermions, which, which acts upon uh, right-handed massless particles differently from the way it acts on left-handed spinning massless spin-half particles. Uh, but if you spontaneously break that, you generate a mass. And for those who have some background in uh, condensed matter physics, the analogy with, super, with uh, what happens in superconductors is roughly, as I've indicated in these pictures, the, on the left-hand side, you have uh, a, a metal uh, with... Um, uh, thank you. On, on the left-hand side, a, a, a met metallic conductor uh, has a, an unfilled uh, ba energy band uh, which doesn't, which uh, which stops at the Fermi surface of energy E zero. Uh, that's a conductor, and there is no gap between the filled part and the empty part. When you when you make uh, a charged Bose condensate which acts as a superconductor by spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, that band split, splits apart. There's a, a BCS gap uh, between the filled part and the empty part, and the electrons that which are in the filled part uh, are no longer able to be excited across the gap to play their role, usual role in conductivity. That's done by the Bose condensate. Uh, what Nambu noticed is that this is rather like the difference between a massless uh, Dirac uh, fermion, a massless Dirac particle, and a massive one. Uh, for, for the massless particle, uh, you have the Dirac C of negative energy states, and without a gap, there's the states which the particles actually uh, occupy uh, uh, or can, can be created in, can be created in uh, as normal electrons. And now, if you spontaneously break the suitable chiral symmetry, you you generate a gap between those two. Uh, 
parts of the energy spectrum so that the C is now separated from the uh, normal electron states by 2mc squared, where m is the mass of the fermion. And that's what the models which, which, which Nambu wrote down uh, do. In fact, they do more than that. They uh, also generate mass differences between uh, isospin, members of isospin multiplets. So the generation of, of mass, or at least part of the mass for ordinary matter, is essentially the Nambu mechanism, uh, although the condensate in uh, Nambu's models is composite, just as in a BCS superconductor. The person who, who introduced a, a lot of conceptual simplification into the field was Jeffrey Goldstone, who uh, read Nambu's work and in 1960 uh, wrote uh, this paper which showed that you could also uh, do the same kind of thing with elementary scalar fields and elementary scalar particles uh, spontaneously breaking a symmetry and the crucial feature of, of how to do it for a, a scalar field, field uh, the kind that Oscar Klein originally uh, wrote about in the 1920s, was to have what's become known as a wine bottle potential, uh, where you have a, a field which uh, is a scalar field but which can contain more than one real component so that it could describe particles with electric charge and other uh, degrees of freedom and that the, um, the potential has uh, a symmetry, maybe a rotational symmetry of, uh, with respect to rotations on those various components uh, but the uh, maximum of the potential function is at the value zero of the scalar field, so that's unstable, and the stable vacuum forms when the when the field uh, or field components have non-zero values. Now, this is the kind of of uh, theory which has entered into particle physics in weak electroweak theory, and it's. Um, in relation to what Nambu did, it's like the relation between uh, Ginzburg-Landau theory and bardeen cooper schrieffer theory and superconductivity. Uh, it, it uses explicit, rather explicitly, uh, scalar field quantities to, to, to perform the symmetry breaking. Really, when people talk about Higgs fields, they should talk about Goldstone fields because he was the person who introduced this kind of mechanism. Now, about this time, um, Robert Prout, who, uh, as I will mention later, did some of the same things that I did in 1964, a little before I did, uh, was in Cornell University and attended a seminar by Victor Weisskopf who uh, commented on this work. Particle physicists are so desperate these days that they have to borrow from the new things coming up in many body physics, like BCS. Perhaps something will come of it. <laughs> I should say at that time, in particle physics, quantum field theory was, was very out of fashion. And uh, a lot of people believed that uh, quantum field theory was a, a sick kind of theory, even though it had been so successful in quantum electrodynamics. Uh, so the next part of the story is a, the is a theorem associated with, with Goldstone, uh, which was finally written up together with Salam and Weinberg. Um, uh, Goldstone being a person who's quite reluctant to publish papers. Um, 
now we're, and you know, the, the thing here, I found that their models contained uh, massless scalar particles. Goldstone made this intuitively obvious that, that this should happen in models with elementary scalars, and they were called Goldstone bosons as a result. It, it's intuitively obvious with the scalar field theories because the Goldstone bosons are excitations which go around the trough of the Weinberg, the, tr the trough of the wine bottle potential, and which require no energy to do so because that direction is flat, and so there is no mass for these excitations. And such theories of spontaneous symmetry breaking are apparently bound to contain such particles. The theorem was formally proved in a form saying in a manifestly Lorentz invariant quantum field theory, if you have a continuous symmetry under which the Lagrangian is variant, invariant, then either the vacuum state is also invariant, that's the traditional type of quantum the field theory, or there must exist spinless particles of zero mass. And I should emphasize the word manifestly in the formulation of that theorem because that's uh, where I came in to the story later on. Um, now, if, if the theories of the Nambu and Goldstone type predicted massless scalar particles, it was a disaster for that program. Uh, because uh, massless scalar particles are, are the really e the easiest kind of particles for experimentalists to, to detect. Uh, there's no threshold for producing them. And not only would experimentalists have found it them easy to detect, uh, but also uh, they would be generated rather easily in stars and upset all the successful uh, theories of uh, energy generation in stars, which uh, say, say the, pro well, the primary process would be electromagnetic. Uh, anything which, which is scalar radi radiation goes that much faster because it can be monopole <coughs> radiation rather than dipole radiation. So this was a crisis for, for the Nambu Goldstone work. <coughs> And in 1963 and 64, the question was, can you, can you evade that theorem in some way? Well, the first person who, who really said what was going to happen, uh, but who didn't receive much attention for it, was the condensed matter theorist Philip Anderson. Uh, and he pointed out that in a superconductor, uh, that there would be a Goldstone mode but for the electromagnetic interaction. But the, the electromagnetic interaction of this Goldstone mode pushes its, pushes its mass up and becomes essentially uh, massive. What's more, and this is the interesting part, it becomes just the longitudinal partner of transversely polarized electromagnetic modes, which are also massive. In other words, you have sort of massive spin-on photons. And this is a, a, a sort of description of what is known as the, well, what, what manifests itself as the Meissner effect in a superconductor where magnetic flux is expelled. And Anderson continued, the Goldstone zero mass difficulty is not a serious one because we can probably cancel it off against an equal Yang Mills zero mass problem. Well, he was, he was right, but he didn't get much credit for that because perhaps, uh, well, the word probably gives it away. He didn't, he didn't actually prove it. Uh, he, 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 for one thing, he didn't actually pay attention to the Goldstone theorem. And if you have a theorem which uh, seems to be getting proved rather rigorously by various mathematicians, you have to knock it down somehow. And he didn't discuss any physical model which was actually relativistic. Uh, but he was right. You can 
evade the Goldstone theorem. Now, I think I will be very brief in showing this transparency because it's it's a rather technical one. Um, it's how the Goldstone theorem actually gets evaded, but uh, that's for a more technical audience. But so let me talk about people involved. Uh, uh, Abraham Klein and Ben Lee uh, um, showed, showed it depended on various spectral functions in commutators of fields. So that's the technical bit. Uh, and um, in the non-relativistic condensed matter theory, there are more possible terms than are apparently allowed in the relativistic theory. And the uh, paper by Klein and Lee uh, pointed out the more general form that, that this expression had in a superconductor and uh, said there's an extra term which depends on the rest frame which specifies the ionic background of the the lattice of the superconductor and said perhaps this could happen in a truly relativistic theory too. The answer came uh, in uh, the same journal Physical Review Letters a few months later uh, from Walter Gilbert, a resounding no, you can't do that. Uh, you can't have a reference to a frame uh, a log frame of reference, inertial frame of reference explicitly in your relativistic theory. Uh, Walter, Walter Gilbert, incidentally, was the Walter Gilbert who, um, some years later, uh, won the Nobel Prize for Chemistry after he'd been working for many years in molecular biology. But, but in '64, he was in transit from working with Jeffrey Goldstone to working in molecular biology. So the following month, um, I, I had the insight as to why uh, the Goldstone theorem could be evaded, but only if you have a gauge field theory. Now this insight, which, which happened really uh, as, as a response to Gilbert's work, uh, it, it, it happened very quickly. It was roughly one week from my reading uh, Gilbert's paper and uh, being rather indignant that he seemed to have closed the door on the whole program, uh, one week later I sent off my paper for publication in Physics Letters. So this is the sort of heart of the story where the eponymous boson appears. So the, the, uh, this is just a bit of chronology. I read, I read the Gilbert paper on Thursday the 16th of July. <laughs> and over the, over the following week, week, weekend, I realized that I, I knew uh, a way out. The reason I knew a way out was that I'd been following Julian Schwinger's papers on gauge invariance and mass. Uh, Julian Schwinger had demolished the folklore of quantum electrodynamics, which says that, or used to say, that the mass, the fact that the photon has zero mass is a consequence of gauge invariance. He showed that it needn't happen for a, 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 a gauge theory quantum. And uh, Julian Schwinger was very fond of using non-covariant gauges he used radiation gauge. He thought that the current ways of using a Lorentz gauge condition in quantum electrodynamics were a bit, a bit phony. Um, so I had seen in Julian Schwinger's papers uh, spectral functions in a kind of quantum electrodynamics in which a photon could be massive um, which contained terms which apparently uh, relativity wouldn't allow. Lorentz invariance was not manifest. So I, I wrote a short paper which was published in Physics Letters saying that uh, coupling the system to a Maxwell-type gauge field 
is the answer. Once you've done that, then the necessary choice of gauge dis destroys the manifest covariance of the formalism without destroying the relativistic invariance of the physics. And that, um, somewhat to my surprise later, was accepted by the editor of uh, Physics Letters at CERN. Uh, by the following Friday, I'd written a, a second paper uh, because once, once I'd realized what the way out was, then I'll, the obvious thing to do was to write down the simplest possible um, model which incorporated a gauge field uh, and um, make sure that the scalar fields in it spontaneously broke the symmetry, see what happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, I, I did that during, during the week. I mean, it's, it's, it's trivial at the, uh, at the level of classical field theory and hence of um, Feynman diagrams at the tree level. And, and lo and behold, uh, the mass, masses were, ma uh, the mass was generated for the photon-like particle, and I sent it off to physics letters, and they rejected it. Uh, well, that, uh, that, that, as you can imagine, uh, both surprised and upset me, <laughs> because they, they had accepted a paper which simply said, said there's a way out of a theorem and rejected a paper which showed the consequences of the way out of that theorem. <laughs> so I, I thought, well, they, they don't seem to understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, the, the, re the letter of rejection said if I worked on my model a little bit more, it might be accepted by Il Nuovo Cimento, which, as I discovered soon after that uh, didn't have referees at the time. <laughs> uh, so, um, oh, I think that, well, I don't know what the date is. Okay, it's in August. I revised my paper by adding some extra remarks. And amongst the remarks was one which said, it is worth noting that an essential feature of this type of theory is the prediction of incomplete multiplets of scalar and vector bosons. So that was the, the later, what was later called a Higgs boson in, in this model, but it wasn't physics yet. And the, um, I mean, I felt at that, that point that I had to, had to say something about why one should be interested in this kind of theory. Uh, so that was accepted, and uh, m many years later, I, I met Nambu, who, who uh, revealed he'd refereed it. And he drew my attention in the referee's report to the work of Onler and Braut, Broken Symmetry in the Mass of Gauge Vector Mesons, and uh, that was published before mine. Uh, and uh, the story I heard when I first met uh, Robert Braut as, which was not until 1992, uh, was that they'd not been very sure whether they got everything right in their paper. They'd been using Feynman diagrams and not Lagrangian field theory, and they weren't sure whether they were really respecting gauge invariance. I, I was using Lagrangian field theory, and I was pretty sure I was respecting gauge invariance, so I, I was more in a hurry than they were. But, but they, they were really the people who had priority in uh, uh, discussing the mechanism which is commonly known as the Higgs mechanism, uh, which is strictly speaking the mechanism for generating the masses of the gauge particles. And it's strictly speaking not the Higgs mechanism, it's the Brout on their Higgs mechanism. I, I once met somebody in Arkham uh, where I'd been invited to give a talk, who confessed he'd just come back from, from uh, Brussels, where he'd given a talk on weak interaction theory. And uh, in his usual way, he'd referred to the Higgs mechanism. And then to his horror, he realised who was sitting in the front row. <laughs> uh, and 
he, he attempted to recover by saying, in accordance with, uh, with, with custom, I, I used the name of the person with, whose name is shortest for this mechanism. <laughs> the, the voice from the front row said, my name has five letters too. <laughs> The, the uh, follow-up of this uh, was um, not until a year later, uh, I, I mean I was distracted by other things uh, like teaching and administration in Edinburgh during the following year, uh, but I'd accepted uh, an invitation to the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, a place where I, I seem to recall Bertel Laurent had, had been several years previously, invited by uh, Bryce de Witt, really on the basis of uh, something I had done related to quantize, quantizing gravity in the late 50s, which, which related to uh, the formalism which Paul Dirac was developing. And, uh, Bryce de Witt was interested in this and thought I was a good person to invite to his institute at Chapel Hill. I think he was very disappointed when he discovered that I was working on this other nonsense. Uh, but what I did in September 65 was to spell out the detail of the model that I'd written down and show how, how to do basic calculations with it with Feynman diagrams. And so that my longer paper, in physical, which appeared in Physical Review in '66, was written then. And the next significant stage in my story was that this elicited a response from Freeman Dyson, who wrote me a highly complimentary letter saying my paper explained a number of things which he which he hadn't properly understood before. Now that, from Dyson, was a real compliment. And uh, he invited me to give a seminar at Princeton, which I gave, that's at the Institute, gave the following year. Uh, sorry, well, he, the letter was 19th, already January 66. The seminar was March the 15th, the day after the United States Post Office issued it's a stamp portraying Einstein as a great American. <laughs> um, and then, uh, and uh, here comes my first, first encounter with Oscar Klein. Uh, I'd already, the, before going to uh, Chapel Hill, I'd encountered uh, Stanley Desser, who's uh, uh, Oscar Klein's son-in-law, at a general relativity gravita gra gravitation uh, conference in London. And hearing that I was going to Chapel Hill, he said, uh, well, let me know if you're uh, going on a seminar, seminar to talk so you can include us. Uh, so he arranged that I gave a repeat performance at Harvard the day after the performance at Princeton. Uh, those, that, that experience, I think, was the most terrifying of my scientific career. I, I, was, uh, I was so terrified of, of the Institute at Princeton that I had to pull off the, the uh, freeway when the sign for Princeton turns up, so I, could, I was driving, incidentally, with my family. I had to pull over into, into a lay-by to stop trembling. Um, and uh, the reactions to my work um, were that um, before the Princeton seminar, Klaus Hepp, who was then an axiomatic field theorist, assured me that I, I, I must have got it wrong uh, because the Goldstone theorem had now been proved rigorously uh, in the language of C-star algebra. C-star algebra was something I, I, I didn't really know anything about. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, the seminar uh, went well enough for Arthur Reichman to uh, accept that what I was saying was not nonsense, so I'd made progress there. Uh, so, but uh, there was still a strong belief that this theorem stood, 
despite what I'd written in 1964. And then at, um, at the Harvard seminar, Sidney Coleman, uh, well, he didn't, he didn't just say it at the time, but uh, um, when I met him years later in 1979, he, he, he re recalled my seminar and said, oh yes, we were, we, were, we were looking forward to tearing to pieces this idiot who thought he could get round the Goldstone theorem. Um, but that apparently uh, also went well enough for them to be convinced I wasn't a fool. Uh, but it was a dialogue, not rather than a seminar, a dialogue between me and the audience. And uh, I think I, we never really got to the point of, of discussing what might be done with gauge theories involving spontaneous symmetry breaking, despite the fact that there sitting in the audience was Shelley Gleischer, one of the gang of four from our 1960 Scottish summer school who came up to me after the lecture and said, that's a nice model you've got, Peter. But he didn't think that it had anything to do with his work uh, on the Electra Week unification of 1960-1961. Uh, so, uh, he had a, a SU2 cross U1 Electra Week model already, uh, but with masses put in by hand, which spoiled the renormalizability of the quantum field theory. So why, didn't, why did I miss that? Well, let me tell you something more about my efforts as a steward at the 1960 summer school. Uh, I was responsible for conserving the wine. I'd been sent, sent out and told how much money I could spend on buying it in Edinburgh. Uh, the summer school was in a, an adult education college a few miles from Edinburgh, and the storage didn't include a, a lock on, on my wine cupboard. So I was busy conserving the, the wine while, as I discovered several years later when I met Kabibo again, the gang of four were intent on non-conservation of my wine. <laughs> and I learnt that, that my leaky wine store had uh, fueled their late-night discussions on Electra Week interactions. And of course, as I was the person who was supposed to conserve it, uh, they didn't encourage me to join the party. <laughs> so I didn't learn of, of Glashow's theory as early as I should have done. Uh, Glashow, incidentally, in his Nobel lecture in 1979, says, surely I discussed my model with Goldstone and, and Higgs and Kibble uh, back in the early 1960s, so why didn't they do something about it? Um, but I think uh, by the time we met again, he was uh, busy doing other things and had almost forgotten his model. So the rest of the story is perhaps well, well known, and I'll try to be, try to be brief. The, um, the, 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 the real uh, unification of uh, electro, electromagnetic and weak interactions came with the paper of Weinberg in uh, 1967, the autumn, the theory of leptons, and uh, similar work by Salam, which was published in a Nobel Symposium the following year. And basically that is a, a, a joining together of, of, of uh, Glashow's uh, model uh, with, with uh, my, my account of spontaneous symmetry breaking in a gauge theory. Uh, just getting the symmetry right and discarding the explicit mass terms which Glashow had. And uh, it took a few more years to uh, be sure that that, that electroweak theory of uh, Glashow of Weinberg Salon was truly oh, sorry was truly viable and it needed the work of well the work first of Feldman and Toft and then of Toft himself for the massive gauge theory 
to show that the, uh, the theory was a renormalizable field theory um, with the masses generated by using scalar fields. And it was after, after that that Hoft's work was uh, announced in the 1971 Amsterdam Conference of the European Physical Society. And after that, the, the bandwagon rolled. And uh, the following year, at the International Conference at Fermilab, Ben Lee, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, reported on renormalizable electronic weak models in, uh, with uh, l a lavish attribution of ideas to me and not much attribution of ideas to anybody else in the story. Um, the particular model uh, of electroweak interactions uh, became respectable for experimentalists once neutral currents had been revealed in 1973 and, uh, and even more so after the discovery of the Charmonium system in uh, 1974. And so this was the beginning of, truly of my life as a boson. interested after they had been persuaded to take the electroweak theory by discoveries like neutral currents and the Charmonium discovery. Uh, there was, was the work of John Ellis, Mary Gaillard and Dimitri Ninopoulos, um, this profile, phenomenological profile of the Higgs boson. Uh, the content of that paper was largely they're saying well we don't know much about it. Uh, the, 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 um, the parameters are still too unconstrained, we can't really tell experimentalists where to look. Uh, this was a during period was during the design and later the building of LEP. So they said we should perhaps finish with an apology and a caution. We apologize to experimentalists for having no idea what is the mass of the Higgs boson, unlike the case with charm, and for not being sure of its couplings to other particles, except that they are probably all very small. For these reasons, we do not want to encourage big experimental searches for the Higgs boson. But we do feel that people performing experimentalists vulnerable to the Higgs boson should know, that it, know how it may turn up. <laughs> Uh, fast forward to 1989 and the story is very different because at the time of the writing of, of the Higgs Hunter's Guide, which was meant for the ill-fated superconducting super, super collider in Texas, um, Lep had done, well, well not, Lep had just started, but so much had been done by then indicating that the standard model was working and Lep, of course, just refined the uh, measurements on the various parameters. Uh, but the authors of this had the following comments. The success of the standard model has been astonishing. The central problem today in particle physics is to understand the Higgs sector. So that's really, that's really why um, the experimentalists started being excited, excited and telling politicians that they needed money to hunt the Higgs. <laughs> and um, let me draw to a conclusion. Um, the, uh, as, as many will, of you will know, the The years of uh, LEP uh, resulted in bounds of the likely Higgs boson mass so that it's no longer something very vague as it was when John Ellis and the others wrote their paper. And uh, by 1995 it, it was less than to be
be less than 219 showed 95% confidence level. Of course, in uh, November, late, well, late two, 2000, LEP, at the end of its run, uh, or some of the groups thought they'd seen something at about 115 JEV, but it later turned out that the backgrounds were much worse than they'd realised. And the story since then, until uh, what we hope is going to happen in uh, November, uh, was really the uh, starting up of the improved version of the Tevatron, which was really um, improved in the way it was improved in order to search for the Higgs boson in the low, low mass range where there'd been a, be rather a, a mismatch between the end of LEP and the beginning of the LHC. So the, um, my, 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 my limits here are, are, are way out of date. 2004, the, the top quark measurements at Fermilab and I think also the W mass measurements had pushed the upper limit at 95% confidence down to 251. And I, I, think it, I think it's now down to about 150. Uh, but Fermilab are busy scanning their data, starting at the high masses and working downwards. And the high mass, if it's a high mass Higgs boson, it's easier to find because you have m maybe more decay processes to, to, to look for. And they've pushed down from 150 JEV at least down to 140, and I think I may be out of date how far they've got by now, but they expected Fermilab to have finished scanning the whole range uh, down to where LEP finished by 2011. So the likely story for the future is that if it's there, and some people think it won't be there, um, it, it should be picked up by Fermilab in the next two years. And I think with the delays which have, hap have happened with LEP, uh, LEP will be in the position of consolidating the, the, that. The, very likely the Fermilab uh, discovery will be very tentative. The, the, the data rate of taking data isn't as big as LEPs will be. Um, but it may well be that they will see it first if it's there and the, then it will be fin finally uh, consolidated by the left da data which will be flowing soon we hope. Thank you.